Okay, for the last talk of the day, we are pleased to have Rahul Jain from National University of Singapore, and he will talk about infinite quantum classical separations. Okay, so uh, good evening, everybody. So, um, uh, of course, I would like to begin by uh, thanking the organizers uh, for uh, inviting me uh, and giving me this opportunity to give a talk. And uh, <coughs> apologies for this uh, uh, this UCL here. I'm actually not from UCL. I'm uh, from CQT uh, and US from Singapore. But my co-authors are from UCL, and as you can guess, I've borrowed the slides from them. But I somehow couldn't uh, erase this. This was like uh, uh, written in uh, hard stone somehow. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, okay. So let's begin. Mm. All right. So 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 this uh, this talk is about. Uh, you may feel it's a little bit different from the usual talks that you're seeing in this workshop. Uh, although it is still related to the theme of the workshop, so uh, the organizers have not made any mistake uh, <coughs> in inviting me. Uh, the, the thing is, this is a bit related to the information loss uh, in communication protocol. So it's still related to cryptography, but maybe not so much as uh, you know uh, device independent and so on. Yeah. Okay. So. <coughs> All right, so, so let, let me begin. So, so, so what is happening is, in this talk, we, what we will investigate is, look, look into is a, a separations uh, between the power of uh, quantum communication protocols and classical communication protocols uh, for various tasks. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, what we know already, of course, uh, from the famous result of uh, Shore, is that factoring can be done super fast using quantum computers. Whereas classically, the best known algorithms are only exponential. Right? So that is, of course, the, one of the greatest powers that we know of quantum computing. Then again, due to Grover, we know that database search can be done in, in square root n, versus classically it means n. Now, for non-local games, uh, so these are the games that we have probably uh, seen uh, uh, during the day. Uh, the CSHS games and the GSZ games and so on, these are the um, two-player games. Uh, for this, the success probability, if you use quantum, uh, quantum uh, protocols, is, is higher, right? For CSHS, you see 85% versus classically 75%. For GSZ, in fact, for quantum, it's 100% versus classically it is 75%. And in, in, in the setting of communication protocols, uh, you know, for, for, for this problem of set disjointness, which is a total function, uh, uh, like gap of square root n versus n is known. And for partial functions, we know, in fact, much larger gaps, right? Exponential gaps, log n versus square root n. So in all these scenarios, we see the power of quantum, right? Uh, which is very good. Okay, now, so in the, in the setting of uh, communication complexity, the question that we ask is, how big the power that we can achieve, right, between the quantum and the classical? All right, so, and, and what we show is, you know, the gap can be infinitely large, okay? Whatever that is supposed to be. Um, uh, <clears throat> Okay, so we'll see technically what it means, but you know, it's I think it's fair to call it infinitely large. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, the setting is as follows. So we have a two-player game based on this PBR. Okay. So what is PBR? Uh, so there is this uh, uh, like a uh, well-known. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, exclusion principle that was uh, sort of sh shown by um, uh, these three authors, PBR. Um, and using this exclusion principle, uh, so this also has connections to, so to the foundations of quantum mechanics. And using this uh, exclusion uh, <coughs> measurement that they exhibit, 
uh, which I will describe uh, in a bit in detail, uh, we, we create this game. Yeah. So the game is as follows. Okay, so we have an input that uh, this player receives, Alice. She sends a message to Bob. Okay. Bob has a question, and Bob has to give an answer, right? Okay, so the setting is simple. Um, <clears throat> so we will exhibit a particular game in which the information, this is, this is our first result, this is regarding the information loss, right? So the information that Alice must reveal to Bob. In quantum protocols, it tends to zero, right? It tends to zero. Whereas classical protocols, it's omega of n, yeah? For n bit uh, long inputs and n bit long questions, yeah? Okay. So that's the result about um, information loss. And now in a slightly different setting where, you know, Alice is also allowed to either send a message or, or send an abort message. Yeah. So Alice can abort with some probability. Typically a probability delta, which is, you know, arbitrary close to zero, but whatever, with some, some small cost, right? Uh, but she's allowed to abort. And then, you know, there are no guarantees. But when she sends a message, a non-abort message, and followed by some other useful message, Bob must answer correctly. Okay? So in the previous setting also, we had that the Bob had to answer correctly. Right? Yeah. So there was no, there, we are not allowing any errors. Yeah? No errors. So even in this abort setting, we are not allowing any errors. We are allowing abort, but in case of non-abort, the answer must be correct. Yeah? Okay. So, all right, so in this setting, what happens is, so in the earlier setting, we had a result about information, and in this setting, we have a result about communication, right? So how many bits, actual bits, must I send to Bob? With entanglement, we show constant bits are enough. Without entanglement, omega of n bits are necessary. Right? So these are our results. All right, so let me begin with the background, right? What is this PBR theorem, this PBR measurement? And then I'll go to the two results one by one. Okay, the background, right? So first of all, the, some background on communication protocols itself. Uh, so here's Alice. She gets an input X. Bob, he gets an input Y. The inputs come from a certain distribution, mu. We have a protocol. Communication protocol, they exchange messages, and at the end of it, they output f of xy, where f is some publicly known function of xy. Right? So that is their goal, compute f of xy. There's a general setting of communication complexity. Now we have like a, you know, tons of models, uh, error models, and various other kinds of models. So there is a zero error, there is you know, two-sided error, there is a one-sided error, this is a hot probability model. There is, you know, you can have shared randomness with or without it, then you can also have entanglement with or without it. Right. So yeah, consider these models. All right. Now, communication complexity. So what's communication complexity? Communication complexity is the number of bits, okay, or qubits, in case one protocols, that they exchange during the protocol, right, to solve this uh, task. Information cost. Information cost is the amount of information that the players learn about each other's input during the protocol. Now, it's possible that, you know, in a protocol, communication is large, but the information learned is small. Yeah? But of course, the other way is not possible. That if information learned is large, then communication is also large. Yeah? So we have this information 
is smaller than gamma three. Okay. Now, okay, so let's come to the PBR theorem. All right. So the PBR theorem. Uh, so their motivation was uh, um, from uh, you know understanding the foundations of quantum mechanics. So. Uh, the motivation was as follows. So, you know, they were worried if quantum mechanics is incomplete. Okay. Now, uh, like already, you know, assuming quantum mechanics is already, uh, life is sufficiently complicated, uh, and they complicated it more by uh, presuming if it is incomplete and so on and so forth, right? But nonetheless, it leads to interesting, uh, interesting things. Uh, <clears throat> so, and they're thinking whether there is a more complete description of the physical state of the system that exists called lambda. And then what is the relationship between the state, the quantum state psi, that be sort of, you know, the good old quantum state psi, and this physical state lambda. All right, so let's say that here is this physical state, right? Okay, so psi represents some physical property of lambda, okay? And, and this psi kind of represents our knowledge about lambda, yeah? Okay? So, so psi is only a incomplete knowledge that we have. The quantum state is only an incomplete knowledge that we have about the actual physical state. Yeah. So suppose there is a you know the, the super quantum world in which we are living, and what we are seeing or what we are calling quantum is only what we uh, have this partial knowledge, right? Okay, so that if that is the situation, they want to kind of rule out such situations, right? So what they do is as follows. So let's say, so we have a quantum view, right? Quantum view. And then there is a physical state view. So there's state psi and phi, right? Let's say we have two states psi and phi. And these are various other bigger physical states, okay? I'm just using the word bigger. <clears throat> underlying physical states. So let's say, suppose lambda 1 gives us this psi. Okay? Lambda 1 gives us this psi. And uh, lambda 2 also gives us this psi. Okay? And let's say lambda 4 gives us this psi. And lambda 2 also gives us... Oh, sorry. Lambda... Okay. So lambda 4 gives us this phi. Phi, and lambda 2 also gives us this phi. Suppose there was this situation where, you know, like a, a set of, a set of, a set of states, a set of a, these big, bigger, bigger physical states gave me one quantum state. But the set of states for psi and the sta set of states for phi could have overlapped. Let's say, right? One potential, uh, one uh, 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 potential uh, scenario. Okay. So there are words for this. Okay. So this psi ontic is the situation where they don't overlap, and psi epistemic is the situation where the sets overlap. Okay. This is the thing. So each quantum state is compatible with potentially many physical states. Here is a set. And two distinct classes of models. One is this psionic, where these are kind of completely non intersecting sets. Here they're intersecting sets. Okay, if they're non intersecting sets, then. Yeah. So what the PBR theorem basically does is rules, kind of rules out this situation. 
Okay, but there are, I mean, there are still ifs and buts to it, but morally, okay. <clears throat> okay, so the psi epistemic model fails to reproduce an aspect of, okay, so what, how do they rule out this thing, right? The way they rule out is, Let's, let's, let's see this situation, okay? So let's say we have a system prepared in a mixture of zero and plus. Another system in tens are prepared in zero or plus, right? Uh, uh, like a half-half probability. Uh, sorry, not probability. This is a, this is a, this is a, this is in superposition. This is superposition, okay? Not a mixture, superposition. Yeah, superposition. So then we have these superpositions arise, right? And then what happens is as follows. So what they do is, let us say we have one, four possible states in, in our ensemble, right? And then the measurement can be done. So what they exhibit is that there is, you can do a measurement, which will probability one. Note that these states are not orthogonal, right? They're not orthogonal. But they can do a measurement, which with probability one rules out some state. So suppose the state actually is 0 plus, they will rule out, say 0, 0. One of them they will say it's not this. They cannot say which state it is, but they can definitely say which it is not. Okay, one of the states they will say it's not this. Okay? This is what they can do with probability 1, right? Even with non orthogonal states. So this is interesting, right? This is interesting. And this helps to rule out this uh, psi epistemic situation. Okay. Psi epistemic situation. Why? Because let us say that there is a overlap, let's say, between zero and plus, right? So typically one would assume that if uh, they are not orthogonal states, you know, their sets will overlap and stuff, right? Because then you know you can start to have common, uh, you know, probability of common events and this. And orthogonal states should have non-overlapping sets. Get the joint sets. Typically, that should be the theory, right? Now, now let's say suppose they actually have an overlap, right? Zero and plus. Then also here overlap. Now you see, suppose the actual physical state came from this intersection, right? Right? Then in in both the situations, like this is non-zero probability, right? This is non-zero probability. The actual physical state came from the intersection here and the intersection here. Then how can you rule out any one of them with probability one? Right? Yeah? Okay. So this is a this is the way they try to argue that cyber string theory is an art. Now, let's see. So, of course, this can be done for like many preparations, right? N systems. And then what happens is this interesting uh, phenomenon is that if for any theta, so suppose we have a very small angle theta between psi 0 and psi 1. So, earlier we had this 45 degree angle, but now let's say we have a very small angle, let's say theta. Then, if we take n large enough, we are able to find a measurement that rules out one of the to the n many preparations, right? So we can generalize it to n systems like this. And the PBR theorem, and they in fact actually give the smallest theta as it is well. So the smallest theta, so for a given n, so there is this relationship between theta and n, right? So this is the relationship. Theta n is 2 tan inverse 2 to the 1 over n minus 1. Okay? So for a very, very, very small theta, you just have to take large enough n. And, and for a given n, you know what the theta is. So, okay. so this is the thing that PBR shows. Now let's say, so, okay, so this is again the same situation where you can have a common lambda and stuff. Now, so we convert this into the following game. What's our game? A,
The game is as follows. So the referee gives, oh sorry, the referee gives a n bit string to Alice, right? An n bit string. And then what the referee tells Bob is, give me a string y, which is not equal to x. So it's not surprising, right? I mean, this game sort of comes up naturally from the previous dance. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So here's the game, and Alice is going to send a message to Bob. Okay. Um. All right. So here's a quantum protocol, right? The quantum protocol is as follows. For each bit xi, Alice will encode it either as psi 0 or psi 1, right? where psi 0 or psi 1 come from this thing, right? We, uh, we saw, right, for any given n, we have the psi 0 and psi 1 at a particular angle, right? And, and that's what a Alice will do. She will encode each of these bits at, with these uh, states, yeah? and just send these states as a message to Bob. And Bob can then just simply perform the PBR, PBR exclusion measurement. Yeah. And then Bob can answer this with probability 1. Right? He will get an answer and he is sure that Y is not equal to X. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what we show is that in this setting, actually, uh, the information received, uh, revealed, is 1 over n bits. Okay? 1 over n bits. That's because of this relationship between n and theta, actually. Right? n gives us theta, and theta immediately gives us information revealed. Right? So one, when one does the calculation, one finds that the information revealed actually is like 1 over n. Yeah? So it becomes smaller as n increases, right? We can see that as n increases, theta becomes small, right? Now theta becomes small, although there are n instances, but theta is like 1 over n squared, actually. So n times 1 over n still gives me 1 over n. This is, I mean, this quadratic thing is what, you know, is, is one of the common features in quantum, right? I and mean, there's a square root and a square that keeps coming in, right? Uh, because of the L2 versus L1 situation. Uh, and therefore, it becomes like 1 over n. Classically, okay, let's see classically. So one possible strategy is that Alice simply sends x1. Okay? And the Bob looks at x1 and chooses some y1 not equal to x1 and announces some y consistent with y1. Yeah? So this is very simple. Alice just needs to send one bit. <clears throat> Although in the quantum protocol we were sending n qubits, in this classical protocol only one bit is being sent. However, the information revealed is one bit. The information revealed there was one over n. Yeah. <clears throat> so what we do is we kind of modify this protocol so that Alice and Bob cannot have a classical protocol with one bit. So what we do is we also also referee now does the following. Referee now gives Bob a subset M of N. Okay. Sorry, a subset of N of size M. Of size M. And then, of course, Alice is not given this subset. And then Bob is supposed to answer a bit string inside that set which is different from Alice's string inside that set. Yeah? So Alice is not aware of that set. So that prevents Alice from just giving, say, you know, just the first bit or something. Right? Because that, then these protocols are ruled out. Yeah, so that's what referee tells. Here are these M locations in this bit string. 
give me a string y such that y is not equal to x at these locations. Yeah. All right. Okay, so let's see a quantum example. Okay. Uh, here we have these, okay, so the encoding remains the same as before. Yeah, so 0, 1, 1, it's encoded as this. But now note the following. You see, in order to do the PBR a exclusion measurement, the theta that has to be used will now depend on m and not n, right? Right, because for any subset, see the encoding is bitwise, independent happening, happening, no issues. There is no correlation between the coordinates, right, for the encoding. So if I were to, if I were to do this thing for any subset m, I can do this, okay, I can do this as long as uh, I'm using the right angle there, there, right? But that angle will depend on M. Okay, so that part is there, you know, you do the measurement and stuff, okay. Now quantumly, so that's what I'm saying. So the measurement, once you, once you do the calculation for the, for the angle and everything, yeah, as I said, the angle will depend on M and the angle, you know, for the angle, the thing behaves like 1 over m square, right? So it becomes n over m square, and when we choose m, you know, quadrat, I mean, it's slightly larger than square root m, then this goes to 0. Right? So this is what happens, and then what, what happens classically? Classically, you know, one can imagine, right? So I'll, I'll not get into the details because I think I'm a bit short on time. So, you know, you know, Bob tries to do, you know, I mean, I said Bob tried to do various clever things, but nothing works out. And uh, the info, there has to be some information revealed and stuff. Okay, so one can formally show that the information relieved is still omega of n for any m which is less than n. Okay. So this is imaginable, right? Classically, there's nothing much. Okay, so now, okay, so we have seen a game to win quantumly, almost NAS and uh, almost no information has to be revealed, whereas classically almost all the information has to be revealed. And previous results, uh, <coughs> of course, were more, more, I mean, uh, were about information, but were also more, most of them were about communication. And they had shown exponential gaps, you see, polynomial in n versus log of n, uh, however, two sided error. In our setting, we are, we are working with uh, no error. And in fact, in the two-sided error, one can show that this is a larger gap that's possible in any case. Okay, polynomial versus polynomial. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's now go to the other result about communication mobility, right? So as I said, we consider a slightly different model where we allow Alice to abort with probability delta. And classically, again, one can argue that with, for any constant delta, the, uh, the communication still needed is omega of n. <coughs> now, quantumly, okay, now quantumly, what do we do? Okay, quantumly, we are now our intention because our earlier protocol, the, the, the communication was large, it was n, right? So our intention now is to reduce communication. So what we do is we use entanglement now, okay? Entanglement, maybe large entanglement, but Communication now is small, okay? Only a constant. So what's the strategy? The strategy is as follows. So let's say if you have xi is zero for a particular bit, what Alice does is she measures her half with a certain measurement, you know, this R0, R1 measurement. Then if xi is one, she measures her half of the entanglement with this measurement, S0, S1, some S0, S1 measurement. So if the outcome is zero, what happens with this measurement actually, the, the property is, if the outcome is zero, Bob's part of the state is steered to psi zero. And the outcome is one, Bob's part of the state is steered to minus. Similarly, with these measurements, the outcome is zero, Bob's part of the state is steer, steered now to psi one. If the outcome is one, Bob's state is steered, steered to plus. Okay. So this is kind of a steering measurement. You do a measurement on this side, depending on the outcome, you know, psi zero or plus appears or psi, psi one or minus. Yeah. Okay, now what happens is as follows. <clears throat> the probability of this success, right, as I said, basically for, for us success is outcome zero because when outcome zero occurs, 
then the state is currently steered. Right? Outcome one is this minus plus we are not interested. Okay, the probability of steering is one over one plus sine theta of m. Okay. So such measurements exist. Okay, good. That's fine. Now, what Alice wants to do is steer all these n states. Right? So the probability becomes 1 over this 1 plus sin theta by m to the n. Now if you set alpha m equal to alpha times n for the constant alpha, then this goes to 4 to the minus 4 to the minus 1 over alpha. Okay? Now this probability is some constant probability, right? For a constant alpha. So with constant probability, we have for large n, still for large n, or n tend to infinity we have ensured that the constant probability you can steer all of them to the right guy right and of course now once you have some constant probability you can boost it up right simply by repeating this game several times yeah so measurement is that yeah so so in, in for getting this probability we require one bit of communication, right? So this is the about probability if you do this. Now repeat it, k times you get this to the k, you just want to ensure this to the k is less than delta, right? So this gives you some uh, constant, essentially, depend if, if delta is some constant. Yeah. So constant communication for constant delta. All right, so these are our two results. Again, let me repeat, without entanglement, classically, Oh, this is our second result. So with classically, uh, with probability delta, omega of n bits are into, uh, without entanglement, that is classically. With entanglement, it's, so we are avoiding entanglement and classical communication in that model. Uh, constant number of bits have to be sent for constant delta. Okay, so this is very good. So then in summary, so PBR theorem, of course, is very nice. It uh, highlights this interesting fact in quantum mechanics and in fact exhibits this uh, very interesting measurement. It, it then can be used to construct a natural game and for this game we show that uh, the information was information for cla classical and quantum protocols has huge separation. Quantum protocols information goes to zero. Classically it's omega of n. And then in this model of with abort, with entanglement communication is constant. Without entanglement communication is omega of n. And of course uh, we're all happy that it's the last talk of the day. So. <laughs> okay, we have time for maybe one question. But so uh, for, for quantum particles, do we know uh, the number of quantum bits uh, has to be big as well to accomplish that task? We know Oh, 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 you mean to say not with entanglements? Yeah. Huh? Protocol without entanglement. No. Uh, you you mean to say without, without entanglement? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quantum bits, but without entanglement. Right. Quantum bits without entanglement, I don't know. Actually. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so this kind of exhibits that this model that is entanglement with classical communication is kind of stronger than uh, protocol with only quantum bits. Although in this case, we do use a lot of entanglement. But communication is, but uh, yeah, but so, so, so we don't know how to save in the model that you're saying. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, thank Robo again. So thanks to all the speakers for this afternoon.